In another lecture, we have looked at the external anatomy of roots, especially looking at the different regions around root apices. In this lecture, we are going to focus on the internal anatomy of roots. And what you can see in the background here is a um, vascular cylinder of a root um, with some xylem and phloem. The topics that we'll talk about are listed here. We will talk first about the different regions of a root apex as a very quick review. Then we are going to look at layers of a root in cross-section, um, starting from the outside and working our way in towards that vascular cylinder. In the process, we'll also talk a little bit about how roots control the movement of water. Then the second topic we'll talk about is lateral root formation. Um, we will specify where lateral roots form and we will look at how do they get from the inside of the root where they form to the outside of the root where they are needed. You've seen this slide before. Um, this is a diagram of the regions of a root apex. And we talked about what each one of them does and where each is located. This is mostly a reminder that you do need to know this information. So starting at the very tip, we have the root cap, um, which we said was protective. We have the apical meristem, which is where we said new cells are added by the process of cell division. But within this region, the cells are still small. Just above that region is the region of elongation. And that is where the newly added small cells, um, as the name implies, it's where they elongate. And hence, um, as they become bigger, that pushes the root downwards further into the soil. Above the region of elongation, we had the region of maturation. And in the, this region, we see that the cells around the epidermis have root hairs. And we talked about the fact that root hairs are projections of the epidermis that increase the surface area and therefore the ability of the root to absorb uh, water and minerals. The root hairs are labeled right here. And then further up the root, we see that we get the formation of lateral roots. If we were to go up even further, we would presumably see larger lateral roots coming off as well. And then at the very top here, they show you a cross section and they indicate that in the very center of the root is the vascular tissue. We'll be looking at that in much more depth. Let's move on now and look at a cross-section in some detail. This is a diagrammatic representation of what a root looks like in cross-section, like at the very top of the diagram on the previous slide. And there's a bunch labeled here, but these are parts that you are familiar with from um, either our previous study of roots or our study of stems. So while the organization is a little bit different, these structures are not, um, very few of them are completely new. And we're gonna go through these structures starting on the outside with the epidermis, then working our way into the cortex, which is this region here, the endodermis, which is the outer of these two concentric circles here, and then the pericycle, which is the inner of these two circles. And the pericycle plus everything within that is part of the vascular cylinder. And so this is where we will have vascular tissue. This is going to include xylem shown here, phloem shown in these triangles indicated here, and in some cases, we will have a vascular cambium. We will talk about what this does, but it's very similar to the vascular cambium of the stem. And finally, in some roots, but not others, we will have pith, which is this area of undifferentiated parenchyma in the very middle. We're going to talk about each of those in detail. Let's start with the outside of the root. On the outside of the root, just like other organs is covered, at least initially, by epidermis. 
And we've said that the epidermis is where root hairs are attached. You can see that in this diagram. Root hairs are long and thin. By long, we're talking typically on the scale of millimeters, maybe up to a centimeter. So not dramatic, but um, long enough to substantially increase the ability of roots to absorb from their environment. They are thin, um, too small to see with the naked eye. So you won't actually see these projections if you look at the root, but you sort of know that they're there. Their function, as we've already alluded to, is to increase surface area. Because roots absorb things wherever the root contacts the soil, if there's a lot of projections, then there's a lot more area that's in contact with the soil, and hence more can be absorbed. And so they allow absorption. We'll move in now to the next layer. The next layer is cortex. This diagram might be a little bit misleading. This shows the cortex as being quite large. On some roots, this could be substan <coughs> excuse me, substantially smaller with the vascular cylinder occupying more of the space. And we'll move on to the next slide and look at a, a microscope image of the cortex as shown here. So this is a cross-section through a root using light microscopy, and it allows us to see the different layers. So first, around the very outside here, this is of course the epidermis. We also can see the vascular cylinder, which is pretty clear as this dark ring about right here. Everything between the um, endodermis and the epidermis is the cortex of the root. You can see that these are large and undifferentiated cells throughout. Those are characteristics of parenchyma cells. Remember that parenchyma cells can do storage and they can do general metabolism. They can also do short distance transport, but they don't have lots of structural material. So they're not, um, they're not for example, acting to reinforce the root. You'll also notice there's these things that look kind of like small cells right under my mouse right here and here and here. Those small things are not actually cells. Those are openings between cells. So this is intercellular spaces. And these spaces are important because they're going to provide a pathway where water can move between the cells. That is true. It's also true that the cell walls themselves have lots of space. So cell walls are made of um, cellulose as well as some other materials. But the cellulose is sort of, it's fibers much like material, uh, let's say clothing is made out of fibers. And just like water can move through um, a piece of clothing, water can actually move through the cell walls themselves. So that means there's really two pathways through the extracellular spaces here. One is in these true spaces and the other is in the cell walls between the cellulose and other materials in those walls. This is going to be important when we talk about how water moves from outside of the root to the vascular uh, cylinder shown here. So we've just alluded to the fact that there are pathways for water to move through the cortex. That's going to be true, but the situation is going to be different when we reach this outer black ring, the endodermis. This is the boundary layer around the vascular cylinder. And unlike the cells in the cortex, for the endodermis, the space between the cells is filled with a waterproofing material. This is a waxy-like material that will prevent water and therefore prevent minerals that are dissolved in water from moving from the cortex into the cylinder or conversely moving from the cylinder back into the cortex. This is going to be super important because it's going to give the plants control over what gets to move into the vasculature and hence get brought up to the leaves and what is prevented from doing so.
So that layer that we just referred to, the uh, waxy waterproofing layer around the epidermis, is called the Casparian strip. And the Casparian strip is pictured here. You can see large cells out here with spaces in between them, so this is all cortex. And then you see this row of smaller cells here with a very thick and bright pink as it's stained strip. That's the Casparian strip. Um, and it stains darkly because it is a waxy material. This is going to be the material that prevents anything from moving between the cells. Now, material is still going to move from the cortex into the vascular cylinder, but it's going to do so by first moving into a cell and then getting transported cell to cell across this barrier through connections between cells. Because it's moving inside the cells, the cells have some control over what gets to move through and conversely, what does not get to move through. Now, I just alluded to this idea, but there are two ways that water can move through cells in the root. One we talked about a bit already, and that was movement either through the spaces or through the cell walls. And that's pictured here. You can see this arrow doesn't go through any cell and instead is going around them. And that's going to be a very important pathway for water in the cortex. The other possibility is that cells in the cortex absorb water from the environment and or absorb some minerals from the soil. Then, because there are openings from cell to cell, that water and mineral um, constituents can move through those openings, cell to cell, as pictured here, until they reach the endodermis. Now, if they are in the cell, they can continue through. If they are in the spaces between cells, at this point, they would have to first enter a cell and then pass through. We looked at this slide once already, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to test yourself. Can you find the endodermis with its associated Casparian strip? So you can pause the video if you need to, but look at this diagram, or this um, light microscope image, rather, and make sure you can identify it. Hopefully you identified the difference right here where the cells suddenly have very dark cell walls and they go from being large to small. So that's our endodermis with its Casparian strip. The next layer in is nowhere near as distinctive, but it's easy to find simply because it's always the next layer in from the endodermis. This is a ring of cells called the pericycle. Peri means around, and I guess it's around the vascular cylinder, hence pericycle. And this layer, even though the cells are nondescript, they're going to do something important. They are going to be the origin cells for lateral roots. So what will eventually be a lateral root is going to start with one of these cells dividing, and then dividing again and again, and we will get a mass of cells forming. Eventually, that mass of cells is going to grow and force its way out through the cortex. Remember, the cortex isn't very reinforced by hard materials. And so it, these cells are going to get crushed or pushed out of the way as our lateral root grows through. We can see that process happening on this slide. So we had some cell in the pericycle start dividing, and eventually the cell had daughter cells and they had daughter cells, and that collection of cells divided in an outward direction, creating this mass of cells. And you can see it's just forcing its way straight through the cortex. Eventually it gets to the epidermis and forces its way through that, and now we have a lateral root that's emerging into the outside of the root, and this will start to be its own independent root. We're going to return now to our vascular cylinder and look at the xylem and phloem. We've seen xylem in leaves and we've seen xylem in stems, and this is true for phloem also.
This means you already have some idea of what they should look like. Remember back the stems where the xylem was closer to the center of the stem and the phloem was closer to the edge. The same thing is going to be true in the root. The difference here is that in the root, the xylem is really directly in the middle, um, at least in many cases. And the phloem, it, oh, the other thing we should say about xylem is it forms a star-like shape. In this case, it's a pretty simple star. It just has three appendages, one up this way, one this way, and one this way. In some cases, there could be many more, depending on the size of the root. The phloem is going to occupy the spaces between the xylem. So if these are xylem, then the phloem is out in this region, and then also, of course, here and here. Now, if you forgot which region was xylem and which was phloem, there would be some clues here. We talked about, with both stems and leaves, the fact that xylem has thickened cell walls that are waterproof. Phloem has thinner cell walls that are not clearly different than other cell types. So you can see the thick cell walls here and the smaller cells with more typical cell walls in the area with phloem. Now, we've looked at a couple of contrasting images of roots, and I sort of glossed this over at the time. But we should pay attention now and notice that there's a difference between how the very center of the root is organized between this top picture, which is ranunculus or a buttercup, and this bottom picture, which is a monocot um, of some sort. This might be prickly green briar, if I remember correctly. Um, so you'll notice in the dicot, the buttercup, there is no pith. The xylem occupies literally the center of the root. In the monocot, you see these big cells that are xylem, and they aren't quite in the center. Instead, we see these typical looking cells that look kind of like cortex cells in the very center. So in this case, for the monocot, these central cells are in fact pith. And if you remember back to stems, stems had pith, and pith was in the middle. So if somebody talks about getting to the pith of an issue, they're talking about getting to the center of it. Um, and pith means the same thing here. It's always going to be the tissue in the very center. Monocots have pith. Most dicots do not. Your book kind of glosses this over and focuses on the dicots and just says that roots never have pith. That's a bit of an oversimplification. It's true for some, but other ones actually do. Now, when we talked about stems, we talked about the primary vasculature that occurred in bundles um, with phloem on the outside and xylem on the inside. But then we talked about woody stems, like a tree trunk here, and we talked about secondary growth. We specified that secondary growth was made by a vascular cambium, and that that vascular cambium was tissue that created new xylem to the inside and new phloem to the outside. We also looked at a cross-section of a stem with woody growth, and we saw that heartwood and sapwood were the xylem in the center of the stem, and the phloem contributed to the bark that was on the outside of the stem. A very similar growth pattern happens in some roots. So you can see in this photograph that there are thickened roots here. If they're thick, that must mean there is some secondary or outward growth. How does that occur? Between the um, xylem and phloem, there can be a thin line of vascular cambium. Initially, this line is squiggly, but then as the root uh, continues to get wider, then the line becomes more of a circle. And just like in stems, the new xylem is going to be created to the inside of the vascular cambium, and new phloem is going to be created to the outside. Let's go back a couple of slides, and so we can see on our diagram where this would be. So if we look back at this diagram, 
we see these black areas. These are representing the xylem, and we see these triangles which represented the phloem. So if you remember to stems, the vascular cambium was a thin layer of tissue between xylem and phloem. The same thing is true on this diagram. This line that squiggles between them is the vascular cambium. As that adds xylem to the inside and phloem to the outside, it's going to cause the root to get wider each time it occurs. We will end this lecture with some final thoughts. First, we've seen a, a consistent um, conflict that different plant organs have to deal with. That is that plant organs need to be able to let materials from outside of the plant in. That's because they are living things and all living things have to exchange materials with their environment. At the same time, all different kinds of plant organs also have to try to um, keep some stuff out. For example, keep out pathogens. And so think about, think back to stems. What were the pathways for things to get into stems? And also what structures were created to prevent things from getting into stems? For leaves, we saw both barriers to things entering, and then we saw some openings that allow uh, gas exchange and some water loss. And now in roots, we have also seen, um, especially with the endodermis, that there's a barrier to things moving into the root beyond the cortex, or you know, closer to the center than the cortex. Um, but there's also a pathway across this, which we've talked about, which is the pathway through the endodermal cells. Another theme of this lecture is that roots show adaptation for absorption. So we've seen this in a couple of ways. The most obvious way is that there are root hairs, and we talked about how they increase the potential for absorption. Another way this happens is the fact that water can percolate through the cell walls of cells in the cortex. We talked about that. This is important because there's so many cells in the cortex that that really increases the surface area by which the plant is exposed to um, water in its environment. In other words, water can filter into the, those spaces between the cortex cells, and then the cortex cells can absorb that water, and that water can travel cell to cell across the endodermis. So by having all of those cortex cells, it increases the potential for absorption. Finally, this isn't a um, unique to roots, but it's worth thinking about how does the vasculature of roots, stems, and leaves work together? Think about the pattern of where the xylem is and phloem is in a root and where it is in the stem, and then try to picture what the connection must look like where the root attaches to the stem. Similarly, think about where the xylem and phloem are in the stem, think about where they are in leaves, and think about what it looks like where the vasculature branches off from the stem and enters the pedial of the leaf. There have to be connections between them because remember, um, both water as well as, um, both water and the xylem as well as water and dissolved nutrients in the phloem have to be moving from roots through stems and up to leaves and with respect to the phloem also in the opposite direction.